Most people are not equipped to understand the seemingly endless facets of an HOA. That's why we're here, to help you become uncommonly prepared to serve your HOA. Whether you're a board member or a manager, join us in the Uncommon Area. Welcome to the Uncommon Area. I am Matthew Holbrook, and this episode is all about a series that we are doing on leadership. And to talk about that today, uh, joining us is Steve Lathrop, Executive Vice President at USI Insurance, and also a captain in the U.S. Navy for 29 years and just recently retired. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And uh, I'm excited about this conversation. We want to talk about leadership, and you bring something kind of unique to the table, uh, almost three decades of military experience along with private sector and business. And um, I think there's some interesting things to explore there just in what you have observed and experienced in leadership. Um, but I, I thought maybe it would be helpful to start off with, um, at, at Action, we've talked, we define leadership as uh, primarily revolving around influence. And I'm curious, who's somebody who has had a lot of influence on you in the course of your career in life? Uh, well, there's been quite a few people and uh, at different stages of my life, different people had um, influence that pushed me to the next level. It started out with a man named Mike Whitmore. He was actually um, uh, a general agent in the insurance business that I worked with for quite a while. And he was also a captain in the Navy Reserve, an Annapolis grad, Vietnam uh, okay. fighter pilot. And so we were pretty close and he was one of the first guys to talk to me a lot about leadership in a way that was different from the executive leadership that I had been studying. Anything that stands out that you remember that you kind of picked up from him or that started a trajectory on leadership with you? Uh, well, in the military, um, one of the things that they were so focused on for leaders and the defining characteristic for them was initiative, a willingness to take action consistent with the, your commander's intent. And so that kind of resonated with me because sitting back and waiting for direction yeah. is, is not the defining characteristic of leadership to me, you know, yeah. inspiring and taking initiative, but also making sure that that initiative is consistent with, um, in the military, we say your hire's intent, your hire command's intent. Okay. Your, your hire command's intent. Mm -hmm. So if, when you're hired, there is. No, your, your hire command. Your, 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 oh, your hire. I see. Yeah. Your hire command. So everybody in the military has a boss. Right. Right up to the secretary of defense who works for the president. Okay. So, you know, it starts with commander's intent. Um, right. And that actually is a critical thing for a leader in the military is to make sure that their intent is clear. Right. So that when people start actually taking action. And it's never according to plan because plans never survive first contact in the military. Yeah. But whatever action that they take needs to be consistent with that intent. Sure. And, the, and that initiative needs to be decisive and uh, many times immediate. Yeah. So to put that together with something we talk a lot about here, um, I, I'll make the, the point that the difference between a good idea and a great idea is a good idea simply just a good idea, but a great idea is a good idea that actually happens. <laughs> yes, um, exactly. You, know, that's, you have to actually make something happen. And then connecting that to what you're saying is, it's taking that initiative to take maybe a good idea um, that is consistent with the intent of whoever is over you, yep. and then putting legs to it and making sure that it does happen. And, and even taking that further, you're, you're saying, circumstances don't always play out exactly as we expect. So still knowing what that ultimate intention is and being able to morph whatever that good idea is into a completed great idea, consistent with the end goal, even if it, if it kind of morphs in the, in the process. That's exactly right. And, and we actually train um, uh, our young officers, our senior uh, non-commissioned officers to do exactly that. And a lot of times we're in what we con consider to be a communications degraded environment where you can't just ask someone what they, what you should do next, what you should do now. That's why you have right. to be able to take that initiative um, decisively in many cases and immediately and, and just know that uh, your training is going to help make you successful. So how does that get established? Like uh, what, what are, what are some important things so that from the hierarchy, there is a uh, clarity of intent? So um, in the military, when they actually issue orders, part of that orders is the commander's intent. He'll actually say, this is what I intend to accomplish. And then this is the method that I want to do it by. 
So, and then that order goes down to perhaps me. And then I put my orders consistent with that intent down to my, uh, my troops and um, down to the lowest level in the Navy, we say on the deck plate, but the lowest level of the deck plate should understand that intent. So how does the, how does the, well, I was going to say the military, but the Navy in particular, or your experience, how is it viewed when there is a clear intent, somebody acts towards that intent, but makes mistakes along the way that like they're, they were, they were acting consistently with, with the direction, but maybe it, it wasn't exactly right. Um, is there leeway? Is there room for that? Or is that? Oh, no, there's absolutely room for that. So if someone is acting in good faith, consistent with my intent and, and then doesn't get the um, result that they expected or hoped for, um, I, I would certainly not be coming down on those people at all, nor would I in my civilian job. So, right. you know, what I learned in the military influenced how I, I lead in my civilian role as well. Sure. And I would much rather have someone exercise initiative and have it not work out as well as we would have hoped than someone who won't exercise any initiative and is just waiting for me to, you know, push them along. Yeah. That's a hard place to get. I found like, you know, from a, from a leadership standpoint, we can want that. But somebody has to have an awful lot of trust in you as the leader to know that, okay, I can go do this and I'm not going to have my head taken off if it goes wrong, as long as I'm acting, you know, with good faith and, and consistently in that way. So there's a dynamic there that, that's, that takes some time to, to build in. There absolutely is. And one of the big differences that I observed early on in my military career is people um, are in the military typically for long periods of time. So... 20 years to get a retirement. It's not uncommon to have people there 20 or 30 years. I think that's less common now in the civilian world. But on the flip side of the military, you've got a new boss every two years, even if you're not changing units because commands only last for two years. So I come in, I've got 24 months as the commanding officer that somebody else is coming in. So there's a lot of cultural um, understanding as well. And in the military, all the services have their core values, and that's what you inoculate uh, people in from boot camp throughout the rest of their career. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting dynamic. That's probably different than the private sector, where you may have the same boss or the same leadership for a much longer period of time. Oh, I, that's exactly right. In fact, in the civilian world, I, most of the time, the managers have been with the organization longer than many of the people who are working for them. Right. In the military, enlisted people may be in a unit for five years. With, with commanding officers going through every two years, they're going to see two or three commanding officers in one tour. So um, I guess this question, I don't know if this, this makes sense, but when you're walking in to that type of a scenario and you, um, you're going to be beginning a two-year stint, is there a, is there a, um, a credibility on-ramp where you have to build credibility with the team under you or with the military, is the credibility just like commanded to be in, um, to be given immediately? Well, it's assumed when they put the new commanding officer in that they've been well vetted. So I think in most cases, the troops expect to get a person that um, is well suited for the role that they're in. And I would say that in the vast majority of time that actually does happen. Um, but what, before I even started, I always sent out um, my command philosophy so that people would know a little bit about me outside of just my official military bio. And that way they would have an understanding of what it was I was expecting and what they could expect from me. So talk to me a little bit about your command philosophy. Okay, well, um, the very first thing I said in my command philosophy is that um, I'm a big believer in small unit leadership all the way down to the lowest level and that I define leadership as more about your willingness to exercise initiative and take action and less about the position that you hold. Um, that it was my responsibility to make sure that my commander's intent was clear and that if anybody was uncertain of it, to ask immediately to get those clarifying questions. Um, I consider communication to be really key, but for me, communication is really a function of knowing what you need to be aware of, and then also um, making sure that you were pushing that back up um, at the appropriate timeliness. Yeah. So we have things like, these are the regular reports, you know, twice a day, certain reports would be pushed up. 
but there are also the immediate reports like, hey, we just had contact, we just had IED, we just had a mortar. And so we'd want to make sure that people knew what needed to be reported right away and what needed to be in that report. That way we'd have that effective communication. All right. So to keep some structure to this conversation, yep. we've we've started off, I think what you've laid out to begin with is the importance of leadership providing clear intent. And, yep. um, and within that clarity of intent, there being room for people to uh, exercise discretion as long as they're acting in good faith towards that. And even an expectation that they expectation exercise. that they would do that, and, yep. and you've used the word initiative a lot. Yep. Um, and so, and so, cultivating that, which um, I would emphasize, requires a lot of trust that has to be built in in that um, in that dynamic. It absolutely does. Um, and then, and then you've moved into talking about your command philosophy, which you first mentioned um, uh, small unit leadership, and then um, and then communication. So I kind of want to maybe tackle each of those individually first. Yep. When you say small unit leadership, you're talking about leadership within different, uh, you use the phrase um, independent of what your position, position or title might be, if we um, refer to that in the, in the private sector. Um, are you saying in that, that you are advocating, because this, this seems counter to what my understanding of the military is, but are you flattening the organization by doing that? Um, or how would you, how would you see the, the operation in that way? Yep. So I wouldn't necessarily say we're flattening the, um, the organization, but what I would say, and the military talks a lot about um, everyone's a leader. Okay. And in a very hierarchy organization like the military, right. that can seem like a contradiction to people. Right, that's what I'm trying to unpack. Yeah. And so what we say is, um, yes, there is a chain of command, but not everything requires permission. And so if you see a better way to do something um, and there's time to throw it up the chain, great. Let your leading petty officer, let your immediate supervisor know, but don't let that slow you down if you see something that needs to be done. It could be something as simple as um, someone observes that there's not a safe way to load, that the ships are not being loaded safely. And so they'll take immediate things to change that. Maybe there's uh, traffic that's crossing, maybe pedestrians aren't clear about where they need to be, and you know we want to avoid accidents in that type of environment. I would expect the person that observes that to take immediate action to correct that and not run and find a supervisor to get permission sure. to do that. So there is, I guess my ultimate question is going to yep. be, would you advocate that this kind of model of, of hierarchy with individual leaders throughout is is um, an ideal uh, leadership structure even in the private sector. And, and where, where I guess I want to go with that is that there is a, um, I think that there is a push and a movement and even a cultural expectation of moving towards more flat organizations mm -hmm. in business. And what I'm hearing you say, at least in the military, is that we still maintain a very defined sense of hierarchy, but within that hierarchy, there is at the same time an expectation of individual leadership. Um, so uh, how, how do you see that translating into, into the non-military world? Well, in, in a business like ours, which is a service business, I try to empower everybody to make the customer happy and not to have to say, well, let me see what I can do for you. I have to talk to my boss. If I've got someone that's having a, a, a problem and we know we can fix it, I want it fixed at that level, irregardless of what the cost might actually be. Um, the worst thing that you can do, I think, in business is disconnect from your customer because you've built this um, approval chain that um, sure. leads to a bad customer experience. Now, I know not every position in a business you know, deals with um, customers and not every area in a business needs to have um, approval at the lowest level. Right. You know, I think most companies require tight financial controls. Not everybody can make a financial decision, but there's a lot of positions that are outward facing that are really the mission of the business. And as decentralized as those can be, as flat as the decision-making process those can be, the faster the um, we can close that loop. Yeah. In our business, like the translation, what the, the example I've given if we had a high-rise building with a front desk team member 
who is making, let's say, less than $20 an hour, and um, they're manning a front desk, and it's the the night before the Super Bowl, and there's a big Super Bowl party planned in the club lounge, and the TV breaks. Um, you know, I would be, um, you know, Super Bowl's on a Sunday. It's a weekend. I, I would advocate for that team member to feel the freedom to go to Costco or whatever, you know, buy a new TV, put it into the club lounge with the full expectation that that's the right thing to do in that situation. They're going to get reimbursed. They have to have confidence yep. to be the, the, the word used um, by most people is to be empowered to do that. At yes. Action, we talk about being entrusted to do that. We're going to trust you. You're going to trust us to support you in that yep. because the goal is in this case, um, you know, there's a big party. The community is depending on having a TV for this. Make it happen. That's. I think that's exactly right. That's a perfect example of that. And if that employee did that and then found out later that they could have got it at a different store at $100 cheaper, right, right. they need to know that they're not going to have their head handed to right, them either. Right, exactly. Yep. Exactly. So, um, and then you, you talked about communication and the importance of communication and leadership. So that, yep. that translates, you have to be able to communicate intention. You have to be able to communicate freedom to act with discretion and expectation of initiative. You have to be able to communicate that we want you to, to function as a, as a leader, regardless of your position. Um, what does that communication, like practically, what does that look like with, a, with leadership? Yep. So in the military, we have lots of acronyms. And one of our acronyms is C2, command and control. Okay. And that command part is that commander's intent. Mm -hmm. And that control part is really where the communication and the situational awareness comes down to. So I don't need nor even want to know every little thing that's happening to every person every single hour. What I need to make sure is people know what's important to me. And that way they're situationally aware and some of it's predictable. You know, these are the types of reports, you know, twice a day muster reports. We know where our people are twice a day. We, you know, give supply updates and stuff like that. So we know what we've got a fuel a status and things, but then there's also the unpredictable. Hey, we, you know, every time we got mortared, we, everybody just knew we have 15 minutes for everybody to be accounted so that if someone didn't report in, you know, then we would send, um, you know, medics out to their last known location. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that didn't actually happen to us. And yeah, we Lots don't of, do that too often in our business. <laughs> no, <laughs> but even in your business, there will be, maybe there's a, a big accident at a, at a high rise building. Sure. You would want to know that at some point and you wouldn't want to find out about it from the news. Right. Um, and so we have that communication and that situational awareness that helps me with the control. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Within that, um, we were talking a little bit before about this idea of communication and communicating around what you know, what others know. Yep. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yes. Yeah, so Joe Harry's window was actually first introduced to me in my civilian career okay. um, by a leadership trainer. Uh, Joe Harry were um, a guy named Joe and a guy named Harry who were psychologists and they were studying communications. And they simply had a little grid where they said on this axis is um, all the things that I know from I know a lot to I don't know anything. And on the other axis is what other people know. And so once you had that grid, you could put in the, the different quadrants, things that I know that others don't know in the um, upper left. And the, and the lower right would be things I don't know and that others know. And that effective communication happened when I was sharing what I knew that perhaps you didn't know. And maybe that in the military world is, hey, this is what hire's intent is. This is what the president has um, directed. And this is why we're doing this. And the other people, the people that worked for me, the thousands or hundreds that were below me, they would have to be telling me what, what's happening on the ground of how we're going to design a plan that's gonna make that effective. So this was this idea of communication is a most effective when I'm sharing all the background with you and listening to your feedback so we can arrive at a great decision. So it's how you, how you in, in that example, how you are combining what the intent is with what the reality of the world is and, 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 and matching those together. That's right. And making sure that as we were coming together to develop a plan that everybody understood why this was happening. Um, and, um, I understood what, you know, what it was going to take to make it happen. 
So from to, to translate that into just uh, general leadership principles, when it comes to communication, um, I think it is important for leaders to be thinking intentionally about what do I need to communicate that I know that other people need to know, and for, commu- for leaders also to be both creating an environment and asking questions around how do I pull out what I need to know that maybe I don't know that others do know. That's, that's exactly right. And if you can create a culture where people feel free to challenge some of the things that you're saying yeah. with what they see as truth, and at the same time, you're open enough to say, hey, this is why we need to do this, then... Um, you'll have a much more effective organization. But what was interesting, the reason I mentioned Joe Harry's window is it wasn't just about effective communication. It turns out that great leaders live in that quadrant where they are sharing the why Mm -hmm. and and listening uh, closely to how people think it should be done. And you get more buy-in that way. And it comes back to this idea of entrustment. People are going to be feel entrusted and then yep. act in accordance with what those expectations you're going, going to cultivate more initiative yep. through that. That's exactly so. right. And, and I learned early on as a junior officer that when people came to me saying, hey, sir, I think we have a problem, my best response was always, well, what do you think we should do about it? Because the very fact that they recognized that there was a problem meant that they probably already had a pretty good idea on how it could be done better, Yeah, what yeah. that solution was. Sure. And even if my idea was every bit as good as theirs, because it was their idea on how to do it, not mine, they were more vested in it. Yeah. So we also, just to shift the conversation a little bit, um, before the, the camera started rolling and the mics were on, we were talking a little bit about uh, servant leadership. Yes. Um, maybe you can, you can talk about that concept for a minute. Um, I will. I'd be happy to. So there was a lot of different styles of leadership, that, and servant leadership was not one of them. And I actually thought that was kind of interesting. When I looked at the, the types of leadership that people were testing to and speaking of, you had things like the pragmatist, the idealist, the politician, the steward. Mm-hmm. And I like this idea of servant leadership. It was first actually shared with me by Admiral Mike Mullen um, when he was a uh, um, the chief of naval operations. And one of the things that he talked about was the importance of making sure your people have what they uh, need to be successful. And it talked, he talked a lot about the humility of the position, particularly in the, in the Navy, where again, you're only going to be the CEO for two years. So you mm-hmm. have that, your, you know, your command ceremony where you're assuming command and it's a it's a snap of the finger, a blink of the eye, and you're turning over to the next person and walking back down that red uh, cloth, never to command again. Yeah. And so you have to bring a sense of humility to the job. But I also tell everybody that humility is not thinking less of yourself, but it is thinking of yourself less right. and thinking of others more. Yep. And I think there's a tendency for some people when they're in newly Uh, put into positions of power where they're very proud of themselves, rightly so, but all of a sudden they seem to be sometimes interested in the perks that come with that and not with the responsibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And even related to that, um, I will tell people that um, if you have to tell someone that you're in charge, you're not. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And I've, I've heard that even unfortunately at action at times where somebody has, has cited their position as a grounds for their authority in a certain um, situation. And um, that is the first sign that you actually don't have any authority. Uh, You don't have the influence. Um, and so, right, you may have authority, but you don't have the influence. You're, you're definitely lacking in that position. Well, you may have the authority from a positional standpoint, but yep. if that authority can't be exercised, you don't really have it. Right, right. I, um, I would agree with that. And so, um, yeah, that becomes becomes an issue. I was telling you before, and I, I do appreciate the um, the concept of servant leadership. I'm not a big fan of the term, mm-hmm. um, primarily because it has, uh, I, I think. Uh, become a little cliche and watered down as far as what people understand with that. Um, you know, in particular, um, a servant leadership is, as you've said, it's defined by humility. Um, but it doesn't mean that it is purely a serving role um, in the sense of always doing things for others. It is leading people through influence 
to work best together to accomplish a particular goal. And sometimes that means that that leader is out in front taking, taking the bullets, taking the shots. Um, and, um, so it's not always just leading from behind. Oh, it's definitely not leading from behind. And the, and the organization's leader does need to be the one who takes all the shots. And hopefully they're also giving all the credit to the team that really supported them along that way. Um, and I think it's a recognition that, um, if you're a servant leader, that it's really your job to serve the organization and not the organization's job to serve you. Right. And, um, um, and again, humility goes a long way towards making that happen. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, getting back to Joe Harry's window for a minute, you know, the leader who says, do it because I said so right. is not sharing the way that they need to, to get that, that, that buy-in. And the leader who says, I don't want to hear it is shutting mm-hmm. down that communication. Well, and they're losing their influence as well, a- which absolutely. is again what the, what the leader is, it, is all about. Exactly. Yep. They're lo- and they're losing the trust. They're losing the influence. Yeah. So it means doing that, that hard work to, um, to maintain that. It also means guarding certain, um, communication. So, there are things at times in leadership that you know that others don't know that they shouldn't know. That's For example, about somebody else. And and when you start breaking those um, levels of confidentiality and you're talking to somebody, uh, one person about something with somebody else, not only are you violating the confidence of the person that you are sharing about, but then the person who's hearing you is going to say, well, if they're saying this about that person, then what are they saying about me to other people as well? Yep. And you, again, you lose trust, you lose influence and uh, the communication breaks down. So there's an awareness of what uh, a leader needs to have an awareness of what is appropriate to share and what is, oh, what ab- should not be shared. Ab- absolutely. Uh, no doubt about it. Um, so one of the things that I actually would, would tell um, a young officers, a senior enlisted is what I referred to as my aha moment. Mm-hmm. And that was an acronym. The A stands for approachable. The H is for humble. And the second A is for aware. So approachable, humble, and aware. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, General Colin Powell, I think, said it best about approachability. He said, there's only two reasons that people will come to you with their problems. The first is because they think you can do something about it. And the second is because they believe you care. Mm -hmm. The minute they think those things aren't true, they will stop coming to you and your effectiveness as a leader has been degraded. So there's a, there's an important aspect on that. I'll let you talk about the H and the A yep. um, further, but um, that approachability, I don't know if it relates to the second A of the awareness. We, we talk a lot about emotional intelligence and self-awareness. And um, there are a lot of people, and I'd put myself into this category, that I um, would feel that they are approachable, but there are certain subtle clues and hints that we give off that sometimes people will perceive to make them afraid to approach you. Yep. And even if it's not true, even if you would actually welcome that, there has to be a level of self-awareness to say, you know what, I can put off this vibe and I need to overcome that so that I can cultivate that that sense of being approachable. That, that's exactly right. And in fact, so when I come to the aware part, I actually say the two things you need to be aware about you're in the military, your commander's intent and your organization, but most importantly, your self-awareness. Yeah. Because if you're struggling to, um, you know, to have that, 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 uh, culture of trust that is so critical to an organization, it's probably because you're lacking in approachability or perhaps you need to recheck your humility. Yeah. Because again, you know, being humble, is not thinking less of yourself. Yeah, um, yeah, thinking thinking of yourself less and uh, and paying attention to other people. It's um, yeah, you know, again, the um, probably the the phrase in leadership that we say the most at action is that we define success as someone who cares about everyone else's success more than their own. Perfect. Um, you know, and I I've, I will say, you know, we have nine hundred and something uh, team members here at Action. Um, I'm going to be more successful personally if every single person cares about other people's success more. So if I have 900 people more worried about my success and I'm the only one not worried about my success, I'm actually going to be a lot more successful. (laughs) Way, you'll be way ahead of me. Everybody on the team would be. Absolutely. um, So approachable, 
um, humble, thinking um, not less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, and then having self-awareness or awareness, knowing what the intent is from those over you, as well as aware of how you fit into that. Right. I mean, there was another great business book that I highly recommend called First Break All the Rules. Mm -hmm. Have you read that? I have. I have. So the very first rule there, you know, do I know what's expected of me Mm -hmm. in my job? So, I mean, these are fundamentals of every organization. But in the military, you know, as we're constantly task forming and pulling people for specific missions, it's really critical that people know why they're being pulled out of their unit to be put in a special task group or a task unit. Yeah. Uh, and then do they have the tools and resources, you know, to accomplish that mission? Yeah. And so, um, you know, it is important that you're aware of those types of things, but I do think the self-awareness is more critical. Yeah. Um, we are running short on time, but there is one other thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, and that is this idea of positive and negative feedback to what we'll say subordinates. Um, sometimes you have to give people negative feedback about themselves and that's part of the leadership role that if, if somebody is not performing or they have made a mistake or they have acted outside of intent or something has gone wrong, there needs to be some type of, of feedback so they know how to, how to correct. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you see that being done successfully, both the giving of positive feedback to people as well as negative feedback. Well, that, that's a great question. So, um, uh, in the military, we have um, evaluations, formal evaluations and midterm counselings. We do that both for our enlisted and for the officers. And, and candidly, your entire career depends on how these things are doing. If you're a person that's consistently being rated below average, chances are you're not going to promote and you will hire your tenure out. You'll run out of time at your certain rank before you can get your 20 years in. So there is a little bit of a meritocracy that was mm-hmm. built in if you're looking to make the military a career. Anytime a person gets an evaluation where they're below your average and that's you know that negative uh, feedback, they should not be surprised. Right. You know that midterm counseling should let them know why they're not meeting your expectations. Um, now there was a culture in the military for a long time about um, you know yelling, uh, profanity physical assault, you know, throwing people up against a wall or a bulkhead. Um, We haven't tolerated that in quite a long time. And I'll tell you, we haven't needed to. um, The millennials that are coming in now, I think are very, very, very motivated. My negative feedback to someone is to say, you didn't meet my expectations. I don't think there's anything I could say that was more disheartening to one of my sailors that I'm disappointed in your performance. Mm -hmm because most of them are there because they really do want to be high achieving. But I have to be clear because I can't say everybody's a superstar and then rank people, right. you know, from number one to 25, someone's going to be below that. I give everybody a numeric score on a scale of one to five. And it doesn't matter if I'm an easy grader or a hard grader because they look at the grades I've given throughout my career to establish my average. Right. So someone can get a 3.5, um, from one person and be well below their average and a 3.5 from somebody else and be sure. at their average. Interesting. So I have to let people know at the six month point, whether I see them, you know, where I see them, yeah. you know, Hey, you need to expect that you're going to get a grade that's below my average. And if you want to be above my average, this is the areas I'm going to need to see significant yeah. improvement. And then on the other hand, for the people getting that feedback, um, the high achievers are going to crave that feedback and, and crave the, even the negative feedback so that they know how to self-correct and how to, how to grow. Well, even the high achievers want to know how they can maintain that for three or four years because it's so competitive to the higher enlisted ranks that you may actually have to be, you know, ranked outstanding three or four times in a row before your package really comes to the attention of the board, yeah. which means several different commanding officers said, this guy's a superstar, this guy's a superstar. And, and only then will you probably be, you know, selected for that next promotion. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I think that's a lot of really good information and, and insight. Really appreciate uh, you joining us. Oh, happy to be here. So I hope you found that helpful. Look for more episodes on the uncommon area on leadership, and we will continue in this series. 